final version of my do-it-yourself solo generator. The original intro video goes over the individual components that we used. In addition to the design updates I have made after the original step-by-step -step instruction videos had been filmed and uploaded. If you are planning to build a solo generator based on our channel's videos, make sure to keep the design changes shown later in this video in mind. The final version of the solo generator is designed to be fully weatherproof, rugged, and portable. It includes heavy-duty quick connects for both the solar panels as well as the battery expansion units. It can handle up to 400 watts of solar panel input and has 3000 watt continuous output AC power inverter with a 6000 watt surge capability. The main case provides AC outlets, 12 volt automotive outlet, and USB outlets all mounted weatherproof and flush to the exterior of the case as well as fully waterproof switches for turning them on and off. We have also added two extremely bright flush mounted LED flood lamps and a voltage gauge to monitor the battery levels. The case is made from a military grade Pelican case with O-ring seals, very heavy duty handles, as well as roller wheels and a telescoping handle. You can add up to four 100 watt solar panels using the simple quick connect and as many portable battery expansion units as you want. The high current quick connector can also be used to power other large 12 volt accessories such as jumper cables and automotive winches. There is also a flush mounted extension cord receptacle that allows you to plug in the main unit while it is in storage. An internal battery tender trickle charger will keep the battery topped off and at a healthy voltage for long term storage ready to go if needed in an emergency. The step-by-step -step videos on our YouTube channel's series will show you how to mount each component and wire every connection. There is also a full parts list with links to purchase each component from Amazon.com on our website. I'm trying to keep the parts list as current as I can. I've had to adjust a few components when they are no longer available. When that happens, I try to select a replacement part that's as close as I can find. The first update that we will be doing is a new waterproof switch. The switch also has a nice tactile feel to it, stainless steel cover, and an LED backlight. We also are including a harness with the switch because the prongs on the switch are pretty small and hard to wire to directly. As always, the first thing you want to do when working on the electrical system is disconnect the negative cables to your battery. If you have the old switch installed, remove the old wires and push the old switch out of the case, removing any excess glue that gets in the way. When we install the new switch, we will want to seal it with the O-ring that it provides in addition to some black silicone RTV that will help to seal up any gaps between the O-ring and the hole in our enclosure. I went ahead and put the O-ring on first and then applied a bead of the silicone RTV behind it. Once the bead of silicone is on there, drop it down into the hole, then go ahead and install the backing nut onto the back of the switch and tighten it down snugly. You can also go ahead and install the new harness at this time, or alternately, if it's easier, you can do the wiring first and then install it afterwards. The new switch comes with two schematics. We're going to be using the schematic that has the LED turn on only when the switch is on. In order to do it this way, the common wire is the power feed from the fused power supply in our solar generator. The normally open switch contact is going to be the output wire to our device that we are powering with the switch, and we are also going to tie that to the positive wire that feeds the LED indicator light on the switch itself. The negative wire is the ground wire for the indicator light of the switch. We will not be needing the normally closed wire in our setup. First thing I want to do is trim off the normally closed wire since we will not be needing it. There are two ways that you can wire this in. One way is to trim off the old connectors if you'd used the old switch design or if you had not done this before and wire them up using butt splice crimps. The wiring will be exactly the same as before, which is to combine the two ground wires on the solar generator side into one crimp. Then attach them to the ground wire coming from the switch harness itself. One of the tricks when you're dealing with different sized gauge wires like I am here is to fold over the smaller gauge wire, doubling up the wires so that they are twice as thick inside the crimp. This makes it much easier for the crimp to be able to crimp tightly and prevent them from slipping out later on. Here I'm combining the LED switch positive wire with the normally open switch output contact that we will be connecting to our device that we are powering. This is the power wire to the flood lamp that the switch will be turning on and off. And finally, we are connecting the used power wire coming from the solar generator fuse panel and connecting that to the common connector on our switch harness. Once you have all the heat shrink tubing 
shrunk down and sealed. Take a zip tie and bundle the wires to one of the mounting bolts. This gives them some additional strain relief and also helps to keep them tucked out of the way. The alternate way you can wire this, if you've already installed the old switches, is to wire the male spade crimps directly to the new harness for the new switch. These will act as a direct swap in for the old pins on the original switch that we used. You will wire up the connections the same either way, no matter which route you decide to use. Just like with the other switch, once we have all the connections in place, make sure to add an additional zip tie to bundle them neatly out of the way. Repeat this process for all three switches. One additional change we'll have to make, the new switches are only rated at 5 amps of current, whereas the old switches could handle up to 10. So for the two circuits that we used the 10 amp fuse, we will need to replace them with a 5 amp fuse. This is to ensure that we don't accidentally burn up our new switch by pulling too much current. The 2000 watt inverter is no longer available, so we've upgraded that to the 3000 watt continuous inverter. It fits in the exact same location, but it has a few advantages. The biggest difference is that this model includes a direct wire port. This makes it much easier to wire into our GFI outlet. The first thing you want to do is remove the cover to the direct wire port and break out the plastic insert where the wire will pass through. You'll want to install a wire clamp onto this breakout hole. Then we'll run some 12 gauge Molex wire. Go ahead and strip the ends and install them on the GFI outlet. The white wire will connect to the silver screw on the outlet. The black wire will connect to the brass screw. And finally the bare copper wire will connect to the green earth or ground screw on the outlet. Once all of those are connected, pass the Molex cable through the wire clamp and then wired into the direct wire ports. The black wire will go to the L or line connector. The white wire will go to the N or neutral connector and the bare copper will go to the earth connector. Once those are firmly connected, reattach the plate and tighten down your clamp. Installation for the rest of the inverter is exactly the same as before. There are some minor adjustments to where the feet go. However, the same general location within the box will work fine. The third design upgrade that we're going to do is to replace the hot melt glue with a little bit better solutions. In particular, the high current quick connector did not hold up real well with just the hot melt glue. So we are going to add a hard mount with an L bracket and we are going to install it on the inside using the through hole that was already on the connector. And you want to stack a flat washer, a spring washer, and then a nut on top of that bolt, all stacked on top of the L bracket and snug that down. Once you have that tight, hold it up against the case and then very carefully drill a hole through the case where the upper bolt needs to go through the L-bracket. And then install a bolt into the top part of the L-bracket as well. Do not attach the washers and nut just yet. We are also going to add some JB Weld quick setting epoxy. This will be a much sturdier glue than the hot melt glue, it will not be temperature sensitive and should hold up much better. Dispense a fair bit of glue, but not so much that you won't have time to work with it. This epoxy sets in about five minutes. Once you've dispensed a fair bit, stir it up thoroughly, making sure to get every little corner mixed up well. Then apply a little bit of the epoxy on the back side of the bracket before you slide it back up against the case. Then go ahead and install the flat washer, spring washer, and nut just like before and snug it down. Before the epoxy sets, apply additional epoxy all around the edges of the bracket 
and along the edges of the side of the case. Once the epoxy is cured, we are going to set the case up on its end and then apply more silicone black RTV sealant into all the seams and gaps that are still remaining. Once you've worked a bead of silicone sealant all the way around the connector, take the weatherproof cap that goes with the quick connector and install that directly on top of the fresh bead of silicone. This will help to keep the cap secured as well as to force the silicone further into those gaps, making it more weatherproof. We're going to use the same silicone for many of the internal components as well that we have previously just used hot melt glue. Make sure that your negative cables are still disconnected from your battery. Apply the silicone to the bottom of the components that we want to attach, especially all the high current connectors. The epoxy sets in five minutes, but I found that it remains soft for quite a bit longer. So it helps to still use hot melt glue to stabilize the joints so that the epoxy can set and cure firmly. The final design update that we are going to do is to replace the plexiglass cover that I had designed for the inside of the case. I had designed the cover to protect the electrical components from shorting out with other items that I may be storing in the case. I like to store other items in the empty space remaining in the case, such as my jumper cable set, my multimeter, and other things that I find useful when I'm using the solar generator. The plexiglass did not hold up as well as I'd hoped, and we need to redesign it anyway due to the new inverter. I found that this military-styled, heavy-duty canvas bag will work better for our purposes. Plus, it is much easier to use. It has plenty of room to hold my jumper cables and several other accessories, and is a nice thick canvas that will not easily tear and will prevent them from shorting out against any of the electrical components below. If you liked this video, please like and subscribe to our channel. I have several more future projects coming that will show you how to build additional solar and wind powered devices, as well as a robotic mower. And as always, feel free to suggest anything else that you'd like to see in the comment section below.